Thank you for joining us for another NetHope Solutions Center webinar today. My name is Madeline No, and I wanna thank you all for your patience as we worked out some technical difficulties this morning and this afternoon and evening, wherever you're joining us from. Um, today, our session focuses on an inner, excuse me, an artificial intelligence primer for nonprofits with USAID. Uh, this will had intended to be a 90 minute session, but we will need to uh, shorten it just a bit due to the, the difficulties we had getting started this today, um, but we will have time for questions at the end. Before we get started, let's go over a few housekeeping guidelines for our session today. Please open your chat window and uh, be prepared to post your questions and comments there during the session. Also later today or tomorrow, please look for a follow-up email that will include a link to the webinar recording and resources and collateral from the session today. And also your feedback is very important to us. We have a webinar satisfaction survey that we ask you to complete at the end of the session. It takes just a couple of minutes. So please do give us your feedback. We, we appreciate it very much. Also, this session is brought to you uh, as part of a series uh, focused on emerging techno te technologies brought to you by NetHope's AI Working Group. Uh, the Working Group membership is open to NetHope members and our next meeting is scheduled for October 14th. This session today is um, a, prep a good preparation for the sessions, uh, the AI and ML sessions that will be coming to the NetHope Global Summit this November, coming up November 15th through 19th. So take uh, check your information for that coming up. Uh, as we get started today, we'd like to hear from you. Please, uh, again, open your chat and tell us why, where you're from and your affiliation. And also please share, when you hear AI, what do you think of? We'll let you answer that question. And as you do, I would like to uh, welcome our speakers for today. Layla Toplik, who is the Head of Emerging Technologies Initiative at NetHope, and Craig Jolly, who is a data scientist with the Innovation Technology and Research Hub at USAID. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Layla. Great, thank you so much, Madeline. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, thanks again for your patience and also thank you for um, sharing um, a bit about your work and where you're joining us from in the chat window. Um, actually, before we get to the agenda for today's session, we'd love to hear from you. So we're going to launch a poll um, to really ask you um, more about your use of AI and machine learning in your work and your organization. So if you can just tell us if you're using it, no, or maybe considering and you're looking for um, this webinar to give you some more information. So let's take a moment to hear from everybody. Okay, Madeline, how are we doing with the responses? Excellent. So those of you that responded no and considering, which is a majority, this webinar is designed for you, but we also hope, Craig and I, that we will offer enough useful information for everybody who's joined us for this uh, discussion. And we invite you to participate actively and to share uh, your use cases, lessons learned and ideas as we move through quite a bit of content. So. I'm going to um, actually share my screen now and we'll kick off with the, here we go, with what we have planned for this webinar. And let me just turn off my video to make it easier for you. Here we go. So the purpose um, of this session today is to really um, give you some time and space to learn about artificial intelligence and ma machine learning and how to incorporate AI and ML into nonprofit programs and projects. As Madeline mentioned, this webinar is part of a larger capacity building effort that's led by NetHope's AI Working Group. Since 2018, we've hosted a number of workshops, webinars, created toolkits, um, two toolkits actually in partnership with USAID and facilitated several project-based collaborations. 
Many of those resources are available in the link um, that's featured on this slide. And Seth will be um, sharing links both in the chat window and then also in the follow-up email. So here's the agenda, what we have planned for you today. First, we'll provide an introduction to AI and machine learning, AI capabilities, machine learn types of machine learning. Then we'll talk about the approaches to putting AI and machine learning into practice. Um, to give you a sense for what AI is good for, we'll share a few use cases and talk about some of the lessons learned from practical implementations of AI in the nonprofit sector. And um, of course, we couldn't talk about AI without talking about ethics or how to responsibly design and use AI systems. So we'll have a segment dedicated to AI ethics with a focus on the principle of fairness. And then finally, we'll share with you what's next in terms of capacity building and where to find additional resources on AI and machine learning for the sector. So um, the outcome of this session should be that you feel like you, that you have a baseline understanding of AI and ML in the nonprofit sector, and that you're inspired to start thinking about what this means for you and your organizations. Um, one last thing to note before we dive into the content of, the, of this presentation, we are trying something new today. It's a bit longer webinar, just to ensure that we get through um, all the key topics in as much detail as possible. We will be sharing um, additional resources along the way, um, and we'll also try to uh, save some time for a short Q&A at the end. So do feel free to post questions in the chat window. We have also a couple of collaborators joining us as attendees. Uh, so you might hear from them uh, throughout the session. And as Madeline noted, this webinar is a prerequisite for the AI and machine learning sessions that we'll have at NetHope Summit this November. And I'll share more about the, the summit at the end of this presentation. So um, let's dive into the content. So why are we talking about AI and machine learning in the nonprofit sector and why now? So there's been obviously quite a bit of work done on AI and machine learning over the past couple of decades, but today really technology's advances are real. We have lots of data every day. 2.5 quintillion bytes of data is generated globally. According to IDC, the amount of data created over the next three years will be more than the data created over the past three decades. Um, then greater and cheaper computing power over the past decade has contributed to advances in AI. Powerful AI and machine learning applications require enormous computational power. And according to OpenAI, compute power used in the largest AI training has doubled every three and a half months since 2012. And we have better algorithms. Second, as societal and env env environmental problems grow in scale and severity, nonprofits like NetHope members need to find new ways and new tools to reach an increasing number of people in need and to do that with limited resources. And then finally, we in the nonprofit sector have a responsibility to the individuals and the communities we support to bring the best, most appropriate tools to support our work, to ensure these tools are used responsibly and to participate in shaping the future of AI in that humanitarian context. So um, as advancements in AI accelerate and AI gets embedded all around us, nonprofit organizations need to understand the best use cases uh, for AI, as well as the potential risks and know how to determine when it's appropriate to use AI um, in their work. So that's why we're uh, focusing so much on it at, in the NetHub community. So what is AI good for? Uh, we know from early practical implementations of AI and ML in the humanitarian sector that AI along with other tools can help us solve a range of problems across humanitarian development and conservancy space. It can help us reach more people with services and information they need, maybe refugees with education or health information. Um, it can help us make decisions and act faster in emergencies, like in disasters. It can help us predict emergencies, maybe infectious disease outbreaks before they spread. Um, it can help amplify human effort and free up limited human resources to focus on high priority work. And also it can help us improve outcomes through real-time feedback 
on the effectiveness of programs and recommendations for improvement. We'll talk about specific use cases later in this webinar. And then three years ago, just as uh, many of our NetHope members, we're getting started with AI and machine learning. McKinsey did an analysis of about 160 different AI social impact um, use cases, and they identified 10 domains where adding AI to the solution mix could have large scale social impact. So those domains, as you can see on this slide, include education, economic empowerment, crisis response, um, health and hunger and others. So um, I'd say if there's one thing you can take away from this is that rapid advancements in technology um, are making more things possible, including greater reach and faster and more targeted response. And this brings both many opportunities as well as many risks. And we'll talk about both in the next three segments. So now we'll focus on some of the kind of fundamentals of defining AI, talking about AI capabilities, types of machine learning, and the process for developing and using AI and machine learning. Let's first start uh, with a definition of what we mean by machine learning, artificial intelligence, and big data. So machine learning, for the purposes of this discussion, we'll define as a set of methods for getting computers to recognize patterns in data and use these patterns to make future predictions. For shorthand, you could think of ML as data-driven predictions. Artificial intelligence uses computers for automated decision-making that is meant to mimic human-like intelligence. Automated decisions might be directly implemented, such as in robotics, or suggested to a human decision-maker, like in product recommendations and online shopping, or maybe diagnosis in healthcare. The most important thing for our purposes is that some decision process is being automated. And for shorthand, you can think of AI as smart automation. And many of you have heard of big data, so we'll define it here. Big data will be defined here as a set of technologies developed to handle data sources that are big in terms of volume, velocity, or variety. And while the term big data emphasizes data management more than learning and predictions, Many former big data organizations have rebranded themselves as AI companies. And so there is a broad overlap in tools and techniques. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Craig to take us through the types of machine learning and AI capability. Craig. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so there are, I wanna start off by talking a little bit about different types of machine learning. So there are, if you read about this, you'll generally, generally encounter these three different broad categories of machine learning algorithms. The first one, and probably the oldest and the best established group of techniques are what we call supervised learning. And when you're doing supervised learning, the really key thing is that you have a set of training data where you are looking at what has happened in the past and you are predicting some thing based on data about what's happened before you then want to encounter new data in the future and make those same predictions based on that. So to make this a little bit more concrete, um, imagine you're running a microfinance or a fintech company and you want to know which of your possible loan applicants are going to be a good credit risk and likely to repay their loans. What you would be doing would be looking at a big pile of historical data about your previous customers and whether they repaid their loans you would train a model based on that old data. And then when you get a new applicant, you would feed the data for this new applicant into your model in order to get a prediction of how likely this person is to repay their loans and whether they would make a good credit risk. The second big category is, in uns is called unsupervised learning. And in unsupervised learning, you don't have a correct answer that you're trying to predict necessarily. You have a big pile of data and you just want to figure out what's going on in there. 
Um, maybe you want to find outliers that are really different from everything else. Maybe you want to find groups that are distinct and have things in common. But you, you generally want to learn something without having a particular target variable in mind. So uh, returning to our microfinance example, in this case, maybe you have a lot of data about past borrowers and you want to think about whether they comprise several distinct groups or different sort of customer profiles so that you can design new loan products to, met, to target those demographics. And so you might find that there's one group that makes slow and steady payments and another group that tends to make payments when they have money and might miss, money, miss payments when they don't. And you can design different products around those if you're able to learn more about the characteristics of those groups. The third big category of machine learning techniques is what we call reinforcement learning. And this one is a little bit different because you don't actually start with data. You start with an environment that is either physical, real world, or a simulated environment. And the task of the computer is to accomplish some goal, to, to reach some goal, to accomplish some task in that environment and it learns to do that by experimenting and learning to maximize the rewards that it's getting. So this has been used a lot in teaching computers how to play games. Um, you know, there was the famous incident a few years back where they, they beat a grandmaster at Go. Uh, I think that led some programmer to joke that uh, we've entered a world where the humans do all the work and the computers play games. Uh, but we've also seen reinforcement learning showing up a lot in robotics. It can be a really efficient way to train a robot to perform a complex task. So I also want to talk a little bit about some key AI capabilities that we'll refer back to. And these are mostly organized around types of data. So the first one, tabular data. If you have ever worked with a spreadsheet, you know what I'm talking about. This is a bunch of rows and columns of numbers. Uh, these things could come from surveys, from sensors, or from a lot of other potential sources. The second big category is what we call natural language processing. And when we're referring to a natural language, we're talking about a language that is intended for the use of humans, things like English or Spanish or Arabic computers are not naturally good at dealing with these things. And so natural language processing is a set of techniques that allow computers to analyze or synthesize the languages that are used by humans. When we're talking about computer vision, which is the third category here, we're thinking about how computers can process images or video in order to do things like identify objects or interpret scenes and events. And just a couple more of these, uh, similarly to computer vision, when we're talking about speech or audio recognition, then instead of images, we're thinking about analyzing audio files. Uh, that could be to do speech transcription. It could be to identify particular sounds. Um, if you've ever worked with Siri or Alexa, you've worked with a tool that does this. And they will often rely on natural language processing to do a better job of converting back and forth between audio and um, between audio and text. And then the last area I want to talk about a little bit is very new. It's very experimental. We haven't seen a lot of applications of this in the nonprofit sector, but we might in the future. And this is content generation, where we're using computers to generate new text or images or video based on examples that it's seen in the past. And there's a lot of really interesting and cool applications of this. There's a lot of fun applications. There's also a lot of really frightening applications when we get into talking about the ethical dimension of things. So I wanna talk about a few broad application areas. Uh, the first of these is chatbots. Uh, you may have encountered some of these. These are a couple of examples off on the right. Let me get my laser pointer out. So this one, um, a company called Farm.Inc. They designed this specifically to help farmers deal with uh, fall armyworm, but broadening out quite a bit more into providing sort of a virtual agriculture extension service. This is one that was developed by Plan International, where they developed this tool specifically to help young women find better employment options. And so 
generally what these things do is they allow users to request information with written or spoken queries that they then respond to. And so they'll rely typically a lot on natural language processing, sometimes on speech recognition. Another term for chatbots that you might see is conversational interfaces. And we're seeing these crop up in health, in agriculture, in financial inclusion, any area where individual people might be coming and looking for advice from the system. Another area that we see a lot of is this idea of personal targeting or screening. And so this is a case when we have resources that are going to be deployed to individuals and somebody has to make a decision about how those are going to be targeted and who is going to get these scarce resources. So on the left, this is an example from a company in South Africa called Harambe that is working to match youth who are at risk of long-term employment with entry-level jobs. And so they, they collect a lot of data on people, they collect a lot of data on possible positions in order to make those matches as good as possible and maximize the odds that these kids will stick around in these jobs. The example on the right here, the green one, is from a company in Kenya called Farm Drive that works with smallholder farmers and they generate a credit score using a lot of sort of tradition, non-traditional data that they're able to collect about farmers. And so these um, personal targeting and screening applications sometimes work with natural language processing. They tend to work a lot with tabular data of different kinds. And we've seen these in employment, in credit scoring, in law enforcement, in health, any situation where a, a service or a resource is being targeted to individual people. So the next category I want to talk about is sort of epitomized by humanitarian response. But the thing that's really different here is that instead of targeting things at people, we're targeting things at places. And so there we might be using satellite imagery, we might be using other geographic information like geotagged social media posts or um, mobile, network, um, mobile network usage data to decide where things should be done. Um, and so this is especially important in humanitarian assistance. Like I said, this tends to use a lot of computer vision and some geospatial analysis and sometimes social media analytics gets into this as well. And so we see this in humanitarian assistance and disaster response and law enforcement, and sometimes in policy planning. And then the last area I wanna talk about is diagnostics. Uh, that are based on images or on audio. And these are often in the form of apps that are designed to be used broadly and in the field. So the one on the left is this company called Plantix. There are many, many more applications like this where you take an image of a leaf that is somehow diseased and it will hopefully give you an accurate diagnosis of what is going on with this plant and what you can do about it. Um, the example on the right is a group that's working in Kenya to do something kind of similar with people's eyes instead, that it's taking images of eyes in order to properly diagnose cataracts. And so we, we see these using a lot of computer vision. Uh, sometimes we see speech or audio recognition or natural language processing showing up also. And there's been some really interesting work lately on using sound to make diagnoses of, for example, if your car is making a funny sound, you would hold your phone up to the dashboard and record the sound that it's making to hopefully get a diagnosis of it. And there's been some work detecting illegal logging using cell phone audio. So I want to back up a little bit after sharing these examples. I want to talk a bit more at a, at a deeper level about what's really going on with AI. So these are our gears that we like showing people. The first gear is data. None of this is going to happen without data. And as we've seen already, data can come in a lot of different forms. Data tends to drive machine learning of different kinds, supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement, or deep learning. These are all things that are picking patterns out of data and allowing us to, um, to move on to the next step, which is creating artificial intelligence applications that are going to be usable by people. So this is kind of an overview of what machine learning projects tend to look like. Uh, you always want to begin with your project definition. Um, 
And then we divine, define these three phases. And Layla will tell us a bit more later about where some of the ethical components come into these. But in general, you are reviewing your data, making sure that you have the right data for the task that you want to perform. You're working on building a model. What these dots here signify is that often people build a lot of different models and then select out the one that does the best job of the things they need it to do. And then this last phase, uh, which is probably the most important one, is integration into practice. How are we going to deploy this in a way that it works with existing systems, and how are we going to maintain it after the long term? And what this arrow down here at the bottom is meant to denote is that it is very, very rare that you go from step one through to step eight, and that's all that happens. What happens very often is that really at any point in this process, you might realize that you don't actually have the right data and you need to go back. Or you might realize that there's a problem with your models and you need to go back and create some more of them or that your evaluation criteria weren't quite right. So this is always an iterative process of um, doubling back and moving ahead again based on what we've learned. So as an example of what happens in this data training process, this is a satellite image of a neighborhood in Ho Chi Minh City. And I want you to imagine that you are involved in an urban planning effort or a disaster planning effort and that you are interested in where the buildings are in Ho Chi Minh City. What are the geographic areas that are built up and where there's likely to be a lot of people who might be vulnerable to damage from some kind of event. And so if the easiest or not the easiest, but the simplest way to know where the buildings are is to just count them. Um, if you know, it'll probably take you an hour ish to count all of the buildings in some images like these. So if you block out about 10 years of your life, you can find all of the buildings in Ho Chi Minh City. And that's not a very efficient way to do things. You could get other people to count them. Uh, we love unpaid interns, we love volunteers, but that's, that's also not really the best way to do things because you're just taking this job that you don't want to do and offloading it onto someone else. You could get a computer to count them for you. Um, and for those of us who learned to program in the 20th century, we learned to do something like this. You, you look at a bunch of roofs and you say, well, they're rectangular and they come in a few different col colors and they tend to cluster together and they're often next to a street. And so you come up with this detailed set of rules for the computer to follow. And then you keep on adjusting and tweaking those rules until they seem to be working most of the time. This is also a lot of work and it tends to really go wrong once you start encountering roofs that are different from what you were expecting when you wrote the rules. The last example here is the machine learning approach where we label a whole bunch of images, show it to a computer, and then let the computer infer its own rules. So this is an example of what the output from something like that can look like. I don't think this is Ho Chi Minh City anymore, but we're, we're looking at a city and these yellow outlines here are the, the footprints of all of these buildings, or the outlines of the buildings. And so this might be what your training data looks like. Uh, if your model works really well, it might be what the outputs of the model look like. And so if we look again at this image of Ho Chi Minh City, you know, we can, we can box out a bunch of features, and if we're going to label this data, we need to go through and identify what they are. So this one's a boat, we've got some trees, and a house, and a field, and a shack, and a business. So what's really happening when we train a model is that humans are going to go through, and somebody has to look at these and decide, okay, this one's a house, this one's a business, this one's a shack. Those go into a machine learning system that then develop its, develops its own rules, we give it completely new images and it'll classify those and say business, tree, and house. And in this case, we did pretty well and everyone is happy. Sometimes things go wrong and there's two, there's a lot of ways things can go wrong, but there's two main ones I wanna focus on here. One is that we might make a mistake when they're labeling a date, when we're labeling data. One of your labelers might get tired or they just might not be very good at this. And they might say, well, this is a shack and this is a field. And of course, as those go into the system, that's going to lead your system to make mistakes because you had those mistakes at the labeling stage. The other thing that might go wrong is that you're just showing it new images that it doesn't know what to do with. Our training data didn't include any airplanes or any houses with solar panels or any swimming pools. 
And so we can't really expect the model to be accurate when it's seeing things that it's never seen before. There's also more subtle things that can be different. If these images are higher resolution, for example, than the original ones, that will sometimes trip a system up. So we're putting things into practice. There's, there's three main approaches that we want to talk about when we are, when we're deploying machine learning systems. And those are based on the capacities in your organization and what you feel like you're well set up to do. And these are in general, this is sort of an outline, I'll get into more detail, but we're talking about whether you have specialized technical expertise, if you have more general expertise, or if you really don't have those resources and you're gonna to have to find them somewhere else. So if you have specialized technical expertise, you can really go out and build your own models. Uh, you might do that yourself. You might get the support of external folks who are able to help from tech companies or from academia. One thing that is very, very common in this field is for people to reuse published models. Uh, there's an approach called transfer learning where you can take a model that was generated to perform a more general task and then customize it for your specific task. And that can make things a lot quicker and a lot easier. It's also very common for people to use open source tools like TensorFlow or PyTorch. Uh, we're also seeing this proliferation of what are called AutoML tools that are designed to automate a lot of aspects of the model development process to speed things up and help you get to a usable model more quickly. Let's suppose maybe you have more general te technical expertise. You're not a machine learning person but you have a team with some software developers who are looking for ways to integrate this without having to become machine learning experts. Um, there are a lot of what people call no code or low code tools. Uh, so typically what you'll see from a lot of companies is that they'll offer a, a light version that's designed for app developers and a heavy version that's designed to be used in the cloud for enterprise customers and integration across an organization. Another thing that we'll often see developers doing is uh, using prepackaged APIs that will do things like text, um, speech to text transcription or image recognition or things like that so that they don't need to build a model to do these standard tasks. They can just make an API call and integrate that into their existing programs. And then finally, you may not have any of that expertise at all. And you might find yourself in more of a role of managing a project and working with external partners rather than building something yourself. And so you want to work with others who know how to do this that could involve contracts or grants or partnerships with academic groups. And our team at USAID has been really focusing on this category because we feel like it hasn't gotten enough attention. And we've been working to develop resources for non-technical project managers uh, like this managing machine learning projects in international development guide. And we're working on a lot more resources, mostly targeted at our colleagues at USAID, but I think a lot of those are gonna be of broader interest for people in the community. The last thing I wanna focus on is this aspect of measuring and learning. So the first point here, we wanna avoid permanent pilots I love pilots, I've done pilots, but they should not last forever. And the key to making a pilot not last forever is realizing that someday you're going to have to move out of the testing and experimentation phase and into a phase where you're really measuring impact and planning ahead for that move. And when we're talking about impact, it's a lot more than just model accuracy. I mean, first of all, if AI systems are supposed to save time and money, do they actually do the things that we're promising they're going to do? And then more importantly, maybe, what are the unintended consequences of deploying a system? Anytime we are automating some part of a process, we're changing the social impact of that process in ways that could affect equity and accountability and access. And we need to plan in advance what we are going to measure and what we're going to look at so that we're capturing some of those consequences that we may not have planned for. What we want to do is uh, spend some more time talking about what we're learning about the problem areas that would uh, benefit uh, the most from the AI investment, and also talk about some of the additional lessons learned based on the practical implementations um, in this sector. 
So based on some of the early practical implementations to date, and I'll share a few additional ones um, in the next few minutes, we know that the problem areas in the humanitarian community that would benefit the most from AI are mainly focused on improving existing programs and processes rather than creating um, solutions that would not be possible without AI and machine learning. And I'll talk about that, the reason for that um, in the on the next slide. But specifically, um, NGOs like NetHope members are looking to do a couple of things. First, free up staff time to focus on other high priority work. And AI can help augment staff capacity through automation of repetitive tasks. Automation can help, for example, accelerate decision-making and response time, like in emergencies. Second, NGOs are looking to extend the reach of humanitarian services and support. One example is chatbots, as Craig mentioned, and chatbots provide self-help options to both humanitarian staff and communities in need. So for example, access to health and education information. Third, NGOs are looking to improve the effectiveness of their interventions and AI can help us optimize and enhance humanitarian interventions through prediction based on the analysis of large amounts of data. And then lastly, we, we also wanted to mention that there is an emerging area that is focused on monitoring and evaluation. So for example, measuring land use change. So there are several reasons why augmentation, self-help and prediction are some of the most promising use cases for AI at this time in the sector. So first is limited capacity and resources to respond to a growing number of emergencies and protracted crises are driving NGOs to get better at anticipating and predicting. Second, starting small with an existing program enables NGOs to do a couple of things, to learn how to develop and implement AI solutions effectively, to also implement change management in order to integrate these AI systems into organizational processes and to prove value of AI and machine learning internally and to the donors. And then lastly, most NGOs still lack expertise, resources, and data to do anything more complex. So um, let's take a look at some of the additional examples of the practical implementations um, of AI and machine learning in the sector. These are by NetHope members. Um, one thing maybe just to keep in mind is that we're still in the early days of applying AI and machine learning in the nonprofit sector. And many of the initiatives are either in exploration or piloting stage are not yet delivering significant benefits on sustained basis. So keeping that in mind, the sector is still taking the first step to explore a whole range of programs and experimenting with different AI um, capabilities that Craig talked about earlier. So for example, the International Rescue Committee is using AI machine learning in a number of projects, including to facilitate jobs matching for refugees and for individualized learning experiences for children affected by crisis. NetHope's Africa NGO members are using chatbots to augment staff capacity in providing tech support and to connect them with technical knowledge. CRS is using AI machine learning to gain a better understanding of resilience in rural areas in Malawi and to improve their programming. The Carter Center um, is using it to get more accurate and timely analysis on the Syrian conflict. Craig already mentioned Plan International Spesa chatbot. Orbis, a new member of NetHope, has developed an AI-enabled platform um, called CyberSight. Um, to, for clinical decision support and mentoring in eye care. And CyberSight includes over 20 ML models to detect site threatening conditions. Um, DRC is using AI and ML to forecast uh, forced displacement in West Africa. And humanitarian open street maps team is using AI system mapping in places like Indonesia to enhance the speed and quality of data that is being added to the maps, like the map that Craig shared with the goal to get more people connected cr to critical services and support. Again, these are just a few examples and would love to obviously also hear from you um, if you're using AI ML and please feel free to share some of those examples um, in the chat window. And one thing to note, the first link that we shared with you takes you to the page that includes webinars that feature many of these examples so you can learn more about them. Now, 
I want to share some of the lessons learned by the NETHO community and again invite you to add any other lessons that you think is valuable for this group to hear about. So number one, it's important to fo focus on the problems that would benefit the most from AI. Um, the key to realizing the full value of AI and doing this responsibly is applying it to the right problems and the right context. Second, start small and realize incremental productivity gains through automation of repetitive tasks. For example, apply AI to the processes that are data intensive and where you actually have high quality data. Um, then get your data in order. If clean formatted representative data is not available, AI will fail to deliver value. Um, related to that, understand ethical risks and be intentional about responsible design and use. We'll talk more about that next. Um, also to connect insight to action and realize the full value of AI projects, it is really important to implement change management, to integrate these systems into organizational processes and programs. Um, partner for expertise, resources and greater impact. We'll have a session at the summit focused on partnerships for AI. Learn from some of the existing use cases like the ones we're sharing today and frameworks like principles for digital development and reuse what works. Like for example, we have some of the chatbot templates developed by our Africa chapter available to anyone who's interested in repurposing those templates. And plan ahead and resource adequately for all stages. So that includes concepting, MVP or pilot, sustaining, scaling, even decommissioning. So this takes me to the next point. Um, designing AI systems for well-defined problems and clear outcomes and with adequate resources and support can not only help you achieve the impact you have in mind, but it can also help you limit the likelihood of unintended consequences and can surface some of the issues and problems early enough to mitigate them. Asking questions helps both bring those opportunities and issues out in open. And here are some of the questions uh, the NetHub community um, is um, thinking about and considering asking before getting started. First, is the problem the right fit for AI machine learning? Second, does the organization, does your organization have or can get access to required data, preferably in digital format? Um, then is there a historical baseline to compare the effectiveness of the new solution? How do you know that it's better than what you currently have? Can the organization connect insights to action? And do you have resources and management buy-in for maintenance and scaling of new AI systems? So just to um, um, add to something that Craig mentioned around pilots, according to Gartner, in the industry, only half of AI projects make it from pilot into production, and those that do take an average of nine months to do so. So um, one thing to note is that in NetHub's AI Suitability Toolkit, we provide a framework of 32 questions that can help you plan for sustainability, and we'll share that with you at the end of the webinar. Now, that um, is a great segue to the next segment, which is AI ethics, and hopefully we're getting some great questions in the, in the chat window in the meantime. So we couldn't talk about AI and machine learning without talking about how we anticipate and mitigate the risks and optimize for fair and positive outcomes. Um, this is going to be a very brief introduction to AI ethics with the emphasis on one of the AI ethics principles, that's the principle of fairness. Um, we, Net NetHope AI Working Group, in collaboration with USAID, and I see Amy is participating in this session. Amy Paul, thank you for joining us. And also MIT D-Lab, we've developed a toolkit and a set of webinars that provide a lot more detail, and we'll share those resources with you at the end of this webinar. So first, let's define AI ethics. Um, there are a number of definitions of AI ethics out there, but for the purposes of this discussion, I really like to use a definition from the Alan Turing Institute that defines AI ethics as a set of values, principles, and techniques that employ widely accepted standards of right and wrong to guide moral conduct in the development and use of um, AI technologies. So briefly, what do we mean by values, principles, and techniques? Values are broad beliefs 
that are held by individuals or groups um, that reflect concepts of social and cultural importance and norms of appropriate behavior. So example of value might be autonomy or justice. Principles, on the other hand, and we'll focus on principle of fairness in this segment, they guide responsible innovation by providing direction for how to embed these values in the design and use of solutions. And principles help us recognize if we're facing an ethical challenge, any action, for example, that disrespects autonomy, inflicts harm, or discriminates is ethically problematic. And then we have techniques that are guidelines, frameworks, processes, various practical tools that help us operationalize values and principles. So let's connect that to what this means in the context of an AI system. When we teach a machine to learn, we're embedding values from the surrounding social context, like our organizations and sometimes personal values. And we, do, we embed these values in the choices that we make about design and use of the system. Now we can use the principles such as fairness and techniques to help guide those decisions and develop AI systems that work in a manner that is considered morally acceptable by us. So if there's one thing that you take away from this is that AI systems are never value neutral and intentionality is key to achieving more ethical outcomes. So after sharing just the definition of AI ethics, I think it is important to um, highlight for this community why this AI ethics matters a matter. And there are many ways to answer this question. I'm gonna just focus on three things. First, the use and reliance on AI has accelerated over the past few years, even more so during the COVID-19 crisis. And AI systems are being used in ways that affect people's livelihoods and well-being, like our jobs, our access to things like healthcare, housing and credit, the way we move around, or even what we believe to be true. So very important. Second, there are a number of growing ethical issues surrounding AI use today. And in order to guide the design use of AI toward optimal public benefit, we in the nonprofit sector need to be aware of these risks and issues. And we've grouped them into kind of three categories, intentional harms that includes hate speech, misinformation, weaponization of technologies, um, and there's infringement on rights and values such as surveillance that might infringe on our rights to privacy, freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, and unfair outcomes like discrimination and prejudice that are stemming from bias that might be embedded in AI systems and the data we use. And then this leads me to the last point. There is an urgent need for intentional investment in responsible AI, and this can actually benefit individuals, organizations, and society in a number of ways. Few are just mentioned here on the slide. So improved impact, maybe through increased representation and reach or through better product quality. Um, second, reducing downstream risk, like mitigating the possibility that systems can cause harm. Um, third, when concerns are identified and rectified early enough in the process, there might be cost savings. So, so costs may be associated with fixing or decommissioning the systems after harm had already been done or costs associated with reputational damage or expenditures in areas such as regulatory compliance. And then lastly, responsible AI can significantly benefit talent acquisition, retention, and engagement. So um, moving to the next slide, before we talk about the principle of fairness, which is the focus of the first installment of our AI ethics toolkit, I wanna to briefly just highlight some of the common AI ethics principles that help us recognize if we're facing an ethical challenge. Um, recently, PwC identified 10 core AI ethics principles out of 200 plus principles that they reviewed from over 90 different organizations. They're all listed here. Uh, plus there's a link to their study. Fairness is one of the principles. The second thing that I wanna highlight here is that establishing principles is just the starting point. Translating these high level principles and to practice is a complex task. So we need to have processes for considering these issues when constructing AI systems, we'll talk about that next. And we also need to have relevant training for developers that are building AI systems. And this is something that NetHope's AI Working Group together with USAID and MIT D-Lab has been focusing on for now over a year and a half. So 
For the remainder of the segment, um, and I might shorten it just to make sure that we have enough time for questions, um, we'll focus on bias and fairness. And bias is defined as systematically favoring one group relative to another. And bias is always defined in terms of specific categories um, or attributes like gender, race, education level. Fairness is defined as just and equitable treatment across individuals and or groups. And the reason why I've decided to focus on um, bias and fairness is because bias is one of the most recurrent harms that automated technologies that are being developed to and used to assist in the delivery of critical services like healthcare can learn to reproduce, to maintain, and to scale. So, which means that as decision making and recommendations become increasingly automated, it's really important for us to be intentional about optimizing AI systems for fair outcomes, knowing how to do that, and being pro proactive in mitigating harmful effects of bias. Again, we have a whole toolkit with slides, case studies, and webinars dedicated to this. And we hope that um, this brief overview, and I'll just go into that in the next few slides, will inspire you to learn more um, how to optimize for fairness and mitigate the risk of bias in your programs and projects. Um, so briefly, um, when thinking about key considerations in fairness, in this discussion in our AI ethics toolkit, we're focusing on several of the most widely cited considerations presented here under three broad questions. How might machine learning model design and implementation cause disproportionate harm? How well do we understand how ML models are working? Would we recognize bias or inequities or um, when and before they occur? And then what happens when things go wrong? So um, let's start with the first question. Um, and three of the most widely cited considerations around fairness and understanding disproportionate harms are equity, representatives, and bias. Um, equity is the first consideration I'll, I'll briefly talk about um, with respect to AI and machine learning. Um, equity is really asking about whether or not the use of machine learning models is resulting in disproportionate benefit or harm across a segment of population. So you'll, you'll learn more from some of our mem uh, webinars, but one thing that I want to note here is that it's important to uh, keep in mind that when we talk about equity, we're not saying that machine uh, learning tool needs to produce the same results for everybody. These tools are often meant to triage or target resources like in credit. Um, or, and also we're not saying that ML models will never make mistakes. There might be times when ML models get it wrong. That could be a misclassifying an image um, as mentioned earlier, or maybe denying somebody a credit who would otherwise get it. What we're really concerned about uh, with regards to equity is when harms start to occur systematically for a specific group. So we have to ask what's driving that particular pattern or outcome? And is it maybe that there's some, un there's some underlying bias that we need to be aware of? In, in the case studies in our toolkit, you'll see several examples of how machine learning models can produce disproportionate benefit and harm. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, representativeness in the context of machine learning relates to the representativeness of data that's used to develop machine learning models because if data are not representative of the real world context in which the model is being used, um, these models can produce misleading results that contribute to inequitable outcomes. Um, and in terms of bias, we need to consider what biases might be embedded um, in data. Um, it's important also to keep in mind, as noted on this slide, that uh, the real world power dynamics are likely to shape what data is available and about whom. I encourage you to take a look at for example, the workforce case study that we have in the toolkit. So moving relatively quickly to the second question, the key considerations uh, around the question, this question of how well we understand how machine learning models are working and would we recognize bias and inequities. Um, the key considerations are explainability and 
auditability and explainability is really about explaining individual predictions or decisions in human friendly terms and being able to interpret the relationships underlying the model's predictions. So there are a couple of key questions to ask here. Auditability is about opening up the model's decision-making process for questions, for inspection, in order to increase likelihood of identifying potential harms and biases ahead of time. And then the third question, what happens when things go wrong? So key consideration here is accountability or how we use AI and ML systems um, has really ethical relevance. And we as nonprofit practitioners need to take responsibility for several things, having mechanisms in place to identify when mistakes are made, um, considering to what extent feedback will be sought from those affected by the predictions the model makes, and then taking actions to redress possible harms that result from mistakes. Um, one thing to note here is that without strong commitment to monitor outcomes and work collaboratively on that, and also willingness to learn from failures, unintentional harms of machine learning uh, based tools may go unaddressed. And then lastly, what are some of the other considerations? Um, you know, a couple of these are framed as questions. Is the use of a machine learning in your context solving a relevant uh, problem? There's so much buzz about AI and organizations might be tempted to use it for reasons that are not directly related to the problems that need to be solved. Like for example, to appeal to donors. So really make sure that this is solving the right problem. Um, is the application of ML technology adding value, like key connect insight to action that will lead to more accurate and timely results? Um, also, does your organization have su sufficient capacity to implement the solution? So that question is constantly coming up. And are there other concerns besides fairness you um, have about the proposed use of the system? So what can you do? So there are a couple of things that you can do um, as a nonprofit practitioner, and I'll just amplify here that this is not just about technology experts and data scientists, um, something that for them to worry about, we all have an active role to play in these processes. So at the project level, you can ask the right questions and I'll get to that on the next slide. You should also decide how you want to define fairness for your model's context. We have covered this in one of our webinars and also in the AI ethics toolkit, we have provided five case studies for you to learn how to optimize for fairness. Um, you can identify sources of bias. Is it historical biases, individual biases on a team or biases in data? And also explore technical approaches to testing for bias and implementing fairness. Now at the systems level too, you can do a couple of things. Strengthen representatives of data available for training machine learning models through, for example, data collection. Um, support the auditing of model outcomes, including consideration for open data and open algorithms. Strengthen digital ecosystem and enabling environment for AI and ML. Uh, this includes including AI literacy, increasing AI literacy of the public and uh, diversify the workforce and organizations working on these systems. So using the same construct that Craig shared earlier that basically breaks the ML project into four phases, these are some of the questions, key questions to ask along the way to optimize for fairness. And we will be sharing this deck with you so you can, um, um, you can keep this in mind as you plan for your project. Um, asking these questions throughout the project, really what it does, it creates a space to proactively mitigate the risks, to identify opportunities for positive impact along the way, and also increases our awareness and accountability for um, the consequences. Um, with that, we are um, racing to the final segment, and that is the resources and the next steps. So hopefully we'll have some interesting questions to come back to. So to help guide responsible, impactful development and use of AI and machine learning in a nonprofit sector, what we've done uh, as part of the NetHub Way AI Working Group in collaboration with USAID and MIT v Lab is to create two toolkits. So these are the first two toolkits were published. 
the ethics toolkit that the first installment focuses on specifically on the principle of fairness and the risk of bias um, that is available to all of you. And the AI suitability toolkit uh, provides a framework with 32 questions to help you determine suitability of AI for your programs and to plan for sustainability. And then Craig, could you talk about some of the resources from USAID? I absolutely can, thank you, Leila. So the, the one that you're seeing on the left here, this exploring fairness in machine learning for international development, uh, this was something that was written by some folks over at the MIT D-Lab. And this one is very much, I see it as targeted toward people who are going to be building technology. So if you are one of the people who is building models or working closely with people who are, this one is for you. Uh, it gets into different mathematical definitions of fairness. Um, it talks a lot about some of the nuts and bolts of what it means to assess the fairness of a model or to try to implement a model that is more fair. Um, the, the one in the middle is a report that my team wrote a few years back, uh, reflecting the past, shaping the future, making AI work for international development. And what this report really does, it's designed at a to explain what AI is and how it works at a very high level and to sketch out some of these questions that you need to be asking yourself when you're trying to deploy AI in a project. Uh, the example on the far right, I've already talked about a little bit. This was really something that we wrote when people read that first report, the reflecting the past, shaping the future and said, okay, but what am I supposed to do? Um, this was our, our effort to make that a little bit more concrete and to give some much more practical guidance on how one can measure, sorry, how one can manage a machine learning project in a way that will help it to be more responsible and hopefully more effective as well. Back to you, Leila. Great, thank you, Craig. And then um, what are some of the next steps? So um, next week, uh, we're doing Train the Trainer um, in AI Ethics for Nonprofits. Um, at this time, the session is full, but if you're interested, we can share a form um, to express interest in future um, sessions. And then at the summit, um, this is NetHope's 20th anniversary summit, we'll have a number of AI and ML sessions. A few that are mentioned here on the slide include um, how machines can augment and amplify our human qualities, um, demos of AI and ML, ML solutions developed by nonprofits, a whole session dedicated to AI and health. Uh, we'll explore, explore partnerships for AI. So what are some of the key considerations and lessons learned? And we'll also talk about chatbots in humanitarian context, both lessons learned and what's next. Um, you can register on the Summit website, which I'm sure Seth will be sharing with you shortly. And you'll learn more of it, about the agenda in the coming weeks. I also wanna flag um, an opportunity from one of the members of our NetHub AI working group from Oxfam. Um, he and a number of others are organizing, Ruben and a number of others are organizing a five-day AI for social good seminar. And we'll provide a lot more information uh, on NetHub Solutions Center, how you can um, also participate in this seminar, which I think also, Hopefully this, this, this set of resources and next steps answers one of the questions in the chat window that is about professional and personal development in, in this field. 